you kind of get a show of hands of anybody that has ever coded .NET in PowerShell. Um, yeah, I, before I did this session, I really didn't know much about .NET. I kind of coded .NET out of necessity because of what I, had, I needed to do. I had a problem that I needed to solve, and I am no way near a .NET expert. It's just one of those things where I needed to get something done, and I'm just going to show how I, I solved this problem. So if you know a lot about .NET, I apologize if you, you already know a lot of this stuff. So, but um, let, me, let me go on. Uh, good shout out to the sponsors that helped make this, uh, this uh, PowerShell conference uh, possible. Um, who am I? I'm, I'm Bruce. I work at Everwise Credit Union. I'm a system administrator. I take care of uh, Application Extender, which is a document management uh, program for our document archival systems. Uh, SMA Opcon, which we just implemented this past year, which is for uh, automation of our financial core and PowerShell, uh, which we I do a lot of integration with SMA Opcon and uh, Application Extender. Now, Everwise Credit Union, this is my second year giving a speech. Actually, last year when I gave this speech, we were known as Teachers Credit Union. And now we're, we did a lot of rebranding because obviously we are, we are also known as TCU. So there's a lot of acronyms of uh, organizations known as TCU. So we went through rebranding, so we won't be known as something else as TCU. So now we're known as Everwise Credit Union. Here's uh, the QR codes for my social media and Everwise Credit Union uh, and my LinkedIn. And I have, uh, my next slide will be uh, for my slides for document, or for the, the slides in this presentation. If you don't get it, that's fine, because it'll be on the last slide also. And also my LinkedIn, along with the survey on the last slide. But I, I have the uh, GitHub page for that also. For the agenda, we'll go over asynchronous processing, which is gonna kind of help lead up to run spaces. Um, if you're not real familiar with uh, .NET, which is kind of what you need to kind of understand in order to do run spaces. And then we'll go into .NET PowerShell, and then run space and run space pools. And lastly, we'll go into a demo, but we'll also have a few demos throughout the presentation to help things move forward. Uh, what is synchronous processing, or why do you care about synchronous processing? Well, the way I think of asynchronous processing is to just make things go faster. Uh, why else would we want to? I mean, as, fa as fast as things move forward, uh, hardware gets faster. I've always come to realize that no matter how uh, improved our hardware gets, Bad programming can still make things go, or can make our, our scripts or programs slow down. And I've found that the hard way. And there's always good basic, good programming skills to help things make things go faster. And .NET Run Spaces is not a one size fits all. Uh, you're gonna realize that there's pros and cons of .NET or Run Spaces. And it's just, some, it's just another tool in your tool belt, another option that you can use um, that might be a benefit to you. Synchronous versus synchronous processing. PowerShell is a synchronous-based scripting language, but it also has ways of performing asynchronous processing. So 
ways to create asynchronous processing. These are not only, the only ways of creating asynchronous processing, but here's some of the top ones that came that I know about. One is jobs, which you just create processes in the background. Another one is reacting to events. Now, we, we do some of this stuff in SMA OpCon, but the easiest thing I think about with reacting to events is uh, file arrival. Uh, a file arrives in a directory, it reacts to an event. For example, we have automation processes that arrive into a directory. Of course, you can just create a scheduled task at say a certain time, and then when it sees a file, it just reacts to it. But you may not know when that file arrives. Why you just want to create a process that um, just waits at a certain time when you just have a service out there or a PowerShell um, script that reacts to, a, reacts to an event whenever a file arrives. And then not .NET run spaces, which is what we're going to talk about. And then unfortunately, for each and start threshold. Those are only in PowerShell 7. And when I had to do, uh, resolve this issue, unfortunately, we're in Windows Server, which only has PowerShell 5. And these for each and start threshold is in PowerShell 7. There is a way of doing it in PowerShell 5, which is workflow, which uses for each and a, I believe a dash parallel. But unfortunately, that was deprecated in PowerShell 6 and, and later. .NET and PowerShell. The following topics we'll cover in .NET uh, for uh, PowerShell. We're not going to cover everything in .NET. These are just some of the top topics because we could spend all day talking about .NET. So some of them are namespaces, types, classes, and assemblies. Namespaces I just like to think about is ways of organizing stuff, basically, or your types or whatever you want to think about. It's just like a folder. You're just organizing it. Now, basically in PowerShell, you put namespaces in brackets. Of course, you just put them in brackets, you're going to get an error. But in this case, I just put it here just as an example. Namespaces, you're going to need to have a type with it. And we'll see that later. So it'll be like namespace, period, type. And then we have types. I like to think of types and classes basically the same thing. Types, is, types describes a functionality of an object. Oop, I kind of skipped over that um, slide. I got ahead of myself. OK, so list.name namespaces. Uh, OK, this is a command that lists all your namespaces on your computer. Uh, not necessarily to memorize a command, but I just thought this was interesting to put out there to list all your namespaces if you want to see what's out there. And But there's an easier way of doing this. If you want to look up what your namespace does, there's a .NET API browser. Let's see if this works here. OK, here's a .NET API browser. Uh, I see it mine, but not on that one. So there we go, .NET API browser. So here's where you can look at all your .NET namespaces, which is a very good resource because you can look up what classes, properties are in it, a lot of other information, but I usually look up a lot, a lot of classes or properties in there, which is how you can interact in PowerShell. So. Let's say we want to look up system. But diagnostics for that. This is for like the command that get dash uh, processes. So we can look up the namespace system dot diagnostics. Or we could, that's a namespace, or we could look up the, there it is, the class. 
system that diagnostics that process. And then just bypassing all this stuff, because what I, I'm looking for is the various properties and methods. And you see how that comes more into play later, but this is a really good resource for all that. So, okay, this is where we, I got ahead of myself, the .NET types, uh, represents the functionality of an object. And then this is what you need to type in at the PowerShell command to get, get an object back would be your namespace .type name. So when I typed in at the API browser system.diagnostics, uh, dot process, that would be system.diagnostics would be your uh, namespace, then process would be your uh, type name. And we'll see that a little more in depth here shortly. So then classes, types and classes are so close to the same thing, almost. But classes are instructions for creating an object. But the funny thing about it is classes, when they're compiled, becomes a type. So, and then classes also have methods. So if you wanted to list or have your method, you'd have after your namespace and type within brackets, you'd have two colons and then your method. And then, so it'd be like, for example, if we were looking at our processes for like get dash process, it'd be your namespace, which would be system.diagnostics, and your type name would be processes, and then colon, colon, then your method for that class, which would be like get processes, for example. And then list namespaces. Uh, this is kind of a convoluted uh, command, but here, basically what we're doing is you got app domain, which is your type name. Now, if you're currently in your namespace, you don't need to type namespace. You only need the namespace if you're, you need to find that location. So in this, in this instance, we're just typing the type name. So it's system.app domain, but since we're already in that namespace, we just type in the, ty the, the type name, app domain. Okay, current domain, which is the property, get assemblies, which is method, get type, which is the method. And then we're just using where object, namespace, or the dollar underscore namespace. And then the system.io, just replace that with what namespace you're looking for. And that'll get you the classes of the namespace. And then I'm not gonna go back to the API browser because I had so much trouble before, but that's basically the same API browser as before. You just go to that API browser and look up your classes or your namespace or whatever you want to, and it gives you all that information for that namespace. Or look up the classes or the properties. Now, that .NET assemblies. .NET assemblies can be static or dynamic, uh, just basically a collection of types. And if they're dynamic, they create a memory. If they're static, they are basically DLLs. And here's how you find out where the DLL is located. Here's your namespace, type name, dot assembly location, or dot location. You can find your, the DLL for that namespace, or get, uh, type name. And for the .NET demo, just a second here. Okay, here we we'll list namespaces of computers. Some of this stuff is what we went through over the uh, present or through the presentation there. Okay, here's that whole command. Of course, here we're just looking at the uh, first twenty objects because if we didn't, it'd just grow off the screen. And here's our namespaces on the computer. 
Now we're just going to look at the object of the namespace and type. So here it's a system.txt namespace with the type name decoder. And nothing special, special about it. I'm just taking random namespaces and type names, just to give an example. Now, if you want to look at what the namespace is and type name, because it may not always be the first couple words for a namespace and the last word for the type name. So if you want to look at, okay, which part of within the brackets is the namespace, you just do whatever is in the brackets and do period namespace. And it would give you the namespace, which in this instance is system. And if you want to do type name, it's dot get type info, uh, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, and that'll give you the uh, type, which is app domain. And then for type, type name of a commandlet, now here's the interesting thing. Uh, if a lot of people don't understand or realize that all commandlets are based off of uh, .NET. So if you do get dash member, it's basically listen, listing properties and methods off of a commandlet. So if you do get dash member, I'm just doing select 20 because if I don't, you won't see the top part of it because it'll roll off screen. You can look at the actual type name of the commandlet. And that's the top part where it says type name system.diagnostic.process. That's the type name, .NET type name of the commandlet. So if we were to, if that's .NET type name of the commandlet, why can't we just type that .NET on the command and get the processes? One thing is if we type the, the .NET, we're just gonna get the object. It's not gonna work, we just get the object. So what we want is the method. We don't want just the object. So for example, if we do get dash member, now we got where object, we'll name like get p. Now the reason I'm doing that is because I'm just trying to show you an example. We're just looking at get process because that's the method that actually does the process, looking up all the processes. I mean, I could just done, looked up there or did everything, but in this instance, the reason I'm showing you this is because there's no get process here. There's only a get property and get, get properties and get property. The reason is because if you do get dash member, it's only giving you the properties and methods of instantiated uh, objects. We don't want that. We want, we want the properties and methods of the class in order to find the method. So if we do that, we want to use get member dash static to find the static methods. Okay, now, see right here we got get processes right here. That's what we're looking for, that method. So now, we got get, just show you the example here, we got get process Select first 20. I'll show you the first 20 of the processes. We do the same thing dot net, system.diagnostics.process, uh, two colons, get process method, select first 20. We get the same thing. So we need that method. It just If we just do the type name, we're just gonna get the object. Now this example, we're just gonna show the classes of the namespace, which is the same example we've shown in the PowerPoint. And yeah, I didn't do select 20, so it just shows everything basically. Now here, we're gonna list the assemblies. So we got system.app domain, good domain, get assemblies. This is going to show us all the DLLs. But there's another way of doing it. There's, uh, from PowerShell Gallery, 
there is a module called Class Explorer, which can do the same thing. Now I already have this on computer, so I just, for an example, I just put in a string, just show you what, what's called. So I didn't actually, don't need to install it and import it. But it's called Install Module Class Explorer, and Import Module Class Explorer. But then the module is called Get Assembly. And that'll get you a little bit different this output, but it basically does similar stuff with getting you the DLLs. So then we can actually look for the PowerShell assembly, which gets loaded every time you open up a PowerShell console. So PowerShell, when you open a PowerShell console, it creates a run space every time. Run space, all that is is just an environment to execute commands. That's all it is. So whenever you open up a PowerShell console, it, it executes or runs a DLL. So all you gotta do is run the uh, .NET System Management Automation PowerShell .assembly .location. And I'll show you this DLL gets loaded every time you execute PowerShell. But actually this is for PowerShell 7, but. Okay. Just gotta find the mouse. There we go. So now I'm to create a .NET run space. So create partial run space. When partial starts, it creates a run space. But you can create your own run space. So if you, for example, we just went over this in the uh, previous example, PowerShell Ma Management Automation PowerShell. That namespace and type name gets run every time you open up PowerShell. Now we don't have to run the namespace system management automation because that gets, because you're in that, that namespace every time you open PowerShell because that gets loaded every time. So you, you could just uh, do PowerShell in square brackets. That does the same thing. So now, in order to create a namespace, it's just PowerShell, colon, colon, create method. And that creates your run space. So methods for the namespace. These aren't all the methods, but these are more common ones that I encounter. You have the add command. All the command is basically a commandlet. So you put in get whatever, invoke whatever you want. Now the interesting thing is add parameter because add parameter isn't exactly the same as in a commandlet, okay? Because the parameter part is whatever value you want, but the parameter name is the same as what the parameter name would be for the commandlet, but without the dash, which is kind of interesting. So you, same thing, but you just have to make sure you remove the dash. And add statement, think of add statement as a pipe. You're just connecting multiple commands. And add script, that could be a file, could be a here script, just a variable if you want to execute as a script. And then a couple more is just invoke and begin invoke. Invoke means execute this now, begin invoke, uh, run it in parallel. Example run space creation. Uh, here's an example of creating a run space. So basically the periods are just connecting the methods and properties together. But you have PowerShell create, add command, get process. Now if we ran just the, the commandlet, the name would be dash name PowerShell, which we're looking for the PowerShell 7 process. But since we're in .NET, we remove the dash, so it'd be just name and invoke. The bottom one is an example of a here string. So we're just put into a variable, PowerShell create, add script, invoke, with the variable script in there. And it's pretty much as simple as that. This one is interesting. Uh, 
because it doesn't take much more to do a run space pull. And run space pull, it's just all it is is run space factory type, create run space pull. One would be the minimum number you want to run. Five would be the maximum number you want to run at, at the same time, that is. And then you open the run space. Okay, so when you create the, uh, the run space, there's a property called run space pull. Okay, so then you add to that run space pull the run space pull that you created up at the top line. And then unfortunately with run space pulls, you want to make sure you deallocate. Yep. Um, it's just, it's just an object, if that makes any sense. It's just basically you just create a run space pool. It's just another object, a .NET object that you're creating. Um, run things in parallel. Um, actually, you'll see that here shortly because I got an example of a run space pool. Basically, what you're doing is, let's say you have a hundred processes you want to run, but you don't want to overwhelm your system. But you want to run maybe five in parallel at one time. And once those five finish, run the next five in parallel, and the next five, et cetera. You don't want to like overwhelm your system or um, actually I got an example here. Where is the RS variable function? Yeah. RS variable. Uh, I don't have it here, but RS would be the run space. So, let's see if I can back up. Oh, like the power trail. Yeah, right here, like when you create a .NET run space pool, the RS would be here. I didn't have it in the, actually that example, because it'd take up a lot of space. So I just, so it'd be like RS would be the run space. And then what you're doing here is the run space pool would be added to the run space. I should have probably added that in there. So like the run space, you create the run space and then the, the actually this one and this one here is the run space pool and you add it to the run space. Let's see if I can back up here. So if I go, See here that so like it'd be like right here. So say for example, RS equals PowerShell create right here. Uh, of course, this would be a little bit different code here. It wouldn't be like get dash process. It'd be something different here, but it'd be like RS equals PowerShell create for that, and then you have to create your run space pool to add to the run space. And actually I have more code that will explain that. And then, but the thing about it is once you create your run space pool, you have to, you need to uh, dispose of it because it'll be just in memory. So you have to like, if, you, if they're jobs, you need to dispose or run space, pull, dispose, or do some garbage collection to get rid of them out of memory. So here's a good example here. So we have the run space, or run space pull, which creates between one and four run spaces, or not really run spaces, but like executes one to four, and it opens it, but then here we have, it creates a job between one, and, executes one and 20. And then for each, uh, or for each there. Now here's where we go. This, this would be where, like in that example, that's where that RS would be. But instead of RS, we're using INST, for instance. But when we add a script, we're just sleeping 20 seconds. 
And the sleeping 20 seconds is just an example, just so we can show. So we're just sleeping 20 seconds. And now here's the example for run space pool adding to, that would be, if, if we went back, back a couple slides, that'd be RS here, rs.runspacepool equals RSP. Here we're just creating a custom object and we're just adding them to ID, the instance ID, the instance equals instance. And here we're doing in parallel, begin invoke. And then here we're adding this, which is the current instance. The invo invocation state info, state. So the current state of what the object's in. And actually I'll run this, uh, this program here in a few minutes so we can see how that works. But basically all it's doing is running them in parallel at four at a time so that you won't overwhelm your system. Question. Yeah? Uh, what's the maximum number you would suggest for that algorithm? That I don't know. <laughs> and then we'll go and look at this here real quick. So look at a run space example really quick. So there's actually a command that called get dash run space. Now, if you don't create any additional run spaces, there'd be just one run space out there, which is the one that PowerShell console creates. If you create a lot of run spaces, the one with ID one will be the one that PowerShell creates. So right now we have, that'll show you your run spaces. Now, just look at real quick at the PowerShell structure. Some of this will be repetition that we just went over, but there's object. There's, we just did it again, but without the namespace as an example. Namespace, type, and static for the method. Okay, here we're looking for the PowerShell process. Okay, let's go ahead and look at, let me pull up a VB code real quick. There we go. So just kicked off that process. Here it's running. So every, I can't remember if it's, 10 or 20 seconds, but there, four is completed. You have to look at every so, so, so often. Yeah, it's every four or every 20 seconds or so, four will complete. And that's pretty much how run space pools work. Just so you don't overwhelm your system and so it doesn't run everything in parallel at once, just every so many that you want to run in parallel. And then now how I, how I solved my problem is I had be able to get some reports into application extender. And it was taking a real long time. So it's like taking a few hours long to get in there. So this is the script I use with .NET to get in there. So here I just use create, I created a module called expand extender text report. So it uses, basically it just looks for text report because it's basically a big report with multiple reports, um, sub reports in it, which is a text file. And it looks for that file, it uses regex because every report starts with uh, a one in the first column. And it looks at that and it splits them out. 
And if I just did a, a test, and on the test it was like one second for .NET, and without .NET it was like, like around three seconds or whatever. Uh, that much, doesn't seem like much time, but when I went from like three out, two, three hours, around 15 minutes, it was a big help. And, then, and the other part of the uh, script, I hear I, I did, I created a PowerShell run space called extend, invoke extender start index. What it does is it indexes the, fo the text files and it maps them from an index file, which is pipe delimited to each of the text file, sub text reports. So App Extender knows how to import them in the proper application within Extender. And all the invoke extender start index um, command just looks for the I report, which it got that variable from the other uh, run space that we just looked at. But then it looks for the file to process, which is the uh, report that is mapped. There, it looks for the import path, and the file index starts with zero. So it looks for those numbers because it mat uh, puts them on the end of the file and with an index, so it knows what to look for. And here it was like 33 seconds for wood.net, and without it was like 63 seconds for just a test for like around 11,000 reports. So the here, as an, as an example, here the folder is empty. If I do, The first part of the script. There we go. So here we look at There's 25 reports. Oops, wrong one. And it puts them in an array. So here's one report. So each report, well, obviously it's an array, so it's zero to 24. But that's looking at one report. If I was to I might use if I do this. Yeah, it's just one big file. Okay, so if I go to the next part of the script, Oh shoot, I was looking at my screen, you couldn't see the folder. But anyway, it generated this, all these files. So if we look at, yeah, I've seen 49801, but. So it creates all these folders and then there's the index file that it creates. I'm gonna put it on the screen. Oh, shoot. It's very hard to look at the one up there.
anyway, it's probably pretty limited. So <laughs> it's hard to look up there. It's like, uh, it has like name, date, uh, title, and then it has like an at sign and then the path. It's just hard to kind of look up there and get all that information. So. But the thing about it is, I mean, if, if it's like something really small and quick, .NET is not your way to go because there's been like, I had like quick scripts and I did time it. And actually your commandlet or the command I, I tested was faster than .NET. You're only going to get your benefit out of .NET if it's something that's really time consuming, long. Uh, this is just something you're just going to have, if you're having issues, it's just something you're going to have to try and say, uh, is this, you know, better? Uh, it's not something, it's just something that's just another option for you to try and see if, if you're having issues, maybe, you know, give it a shot and see if it's something that will work for you. So, I mean, call to action, uh, you know, if, you're, if your scripts are running long, just use good programming practices. There's been times where, my script's running long. I'm doing something as simple as I'm writing all my files to a drive. And then I just start putting them in an array, you know, and then and before writing them to a file where memory is faster than your drive and I see a big performance boost. It's just simple things like that, good pro pro uh, programming practices. And uh, .NET might not be, you know, the best solution, but you know, if you're having issues with speed, give it a try, or even run spaces. And when I, I was having an issue, this was like my go-to resource. This was a really good book. Uh, if you want to like learn more about .NET or run spaces, I believe uh, chapter five was, uh, I'm thinking .NET, and then I'm thinking 15, I could have it wrong, but I think 15 was, asynchronous processing where run spaces was inside the chapter for asynchronous processing or something like that. But if you're interested in any more information, that was a really good book. And then uh, if you want like to miss anything, any more information that you want to get or learn more about from my slides, there's a QR code for documentation, which is on the GitHub. There's my LinkedIn and there's a survey. Last year was my first time and uh, I found those very helpful, making me a uh, better presenter. Um, but I thank you for coming and if anybody has any more questions. So. <clears throat>